Ingrid and Ava for helping us organize this event. And thank you to family and friends and visitors for showing up today to support our graduating seniors. California College of the Arts campuses are located in Hichuin and Yaluma, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively, on the unceded territories of Chechenyo and Ramatush Ohlone peoples, who have continuously lived on this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples past, present and future here and around the world. And we wish to pay to respect to local elders, including those of the lands from which you are joining us virtually today. Again, thank you and welcome to today's presentations. If you can please remind or uh, please turn off your audio during the presentation to ensure the presenters um, premium audio for the presentations, that would be great. So make sure that you're on mute for the presentations. Um, this is the BFA thesis conversations that are being held uh, all uh, the final weeks, the concluding weeks of the semester here to celebrate our graduating seniors. Today, we are having presenters Mia Jirasi, Summer Storm, Rolando Rosales, and Kayla Savello um, here today to present their presentations. Each artist will give a 10 minute presentation to their work. After each presentation, our visiting respondent will have a 10 minute conversation with the student providing feedback and asking them questions. Please note that we won't have time during this event for a public Q&A, but we encourage attendees to drop comments, affirmations and questions for the seniors in the Zoom chat. The chat transcript will be saved at the end of this event and will be sent to the seniors at a, as a sort of virtual guest book. Um, but before we get started, I would like to introduce our visiting respondent, Maxine Schofer Wolf is a multimedia artist. Wave Maxine, hello, thank you for joining us. She is based in Berkeley, California, working across drawing, painting, and writing and video. She received a BA from University of California, Los Angeles, and her MFA from California College of the Arts. She has exhibited and screened work locally in the San Francisco Bay Area, Brooklyn, New York, and Chicago. She is the head of programs at Slash, a nonprofit space in San Francisco founded in 2018 to advance and promote the expanding field of contemporary art in Northern California. Through exhibitions, publication, publications, and programming, public programming, one of Maxine's focuses at Slash is directing Room, the space dedicated to open call based projects by local and emerging artists. Thank you so much for joining us, Ingrid. So now I would like our first presenter to share screen, Summer Storm. Yes, let me share my screen. Um, one sec. Okay. Hello, my name is Summer Strom and I'm an individualized major here at CCA. The two curriculums I focused on during these past four years are fashion design and painting and drawing. The art practice I've developed is what I call art of, for, and with the body. This includes depicting bodies, making wearables, using my own body, and doing art directly on the body. I am strongly driven by color, line, femininity, beauty, and magic. I started CCA as a fashion design major as I find a lot of joy in expressing myself through body adornment. It was through the fashion classes that I was introduced to the world of textiles and was also able to build my skills with sewing and clothing construction. Two of my favorite artists are Janelle Del Cid and Francesca Woodman. I am drawn to these artists because I can see myself in them 
and they give me hope and inspire me that I too can be a successful artist. Both Del Cid and Woodman work in photographic self-portraiture with a focus on the sensual, sultry, and otherworldly. I also largely work in self-portraiture and I'd like to share some of my favorites. The self-portrait is important to me because it is the first instance where you can see the sketchbook that I'm drawing on in the drawing itself. I love drawing live figure models, but when the pandemic started, I no longer had access to live models. My solution was to use a mirror and use myself as my own model. This idea of using a mirror and seeing the sketchbook within the drawing is expanded with this piece. Not only can you see the sketchbook, but also a drawing of the drawing, creating a sort of meta feedback loop. For this piece, I photographed myself in the pose I wanted to use as reference. This piece is important to me because it merges self-portraiture, experimentation with larger sizing, and incorporating fabric and sewing. I'd also like to share some fabric works that combine textile with painting. This piece, Skylight Dreams, is installed on my bedroom ceiling above my bed. The idea is that the veils are thinned in a way that the viewer can't tell if they are looking at the sky with fish swimming in the stars, or if they are looking at a reflection of the sky in water. I can look up at this fabric painting as I fall asleep and use it as a portal to transport myself into a dream world when I close my eyes. This is a shawl that I made with recycled leather scraps and it highlights my love for line and color. It also shows how textile bridges the world of fashion and painting. I purposefully sewed the shawl with the seams on the outside for two reasons. One being for comfort, as the stiff seams would poke the wearer if they were on the inside. Secondly, I really liked the natural roughness of the raw edges of the leather scraps and I wanted to show it off. It makes for a nice contrast against the geometric nature of the topical design. Now I'd like to talk about my thesis work. The title of this body of work is called Crying in Color and my artist statement is as follows. Tears, something I used to hate and push away but now deeply crave. Growing up, crying was a daily ritual that could strike at any moment. For the past four years, however, my crying spells have become far and few between due to psychiatric medication. I now find myself wishing that I would cry, an odd sensation after so many years of pushing the tears away. I've been looking for a way to better my relationship with crying, and these works are a vital step to this process. These textiles represent a gateway into the emotions I experience when crying. Melancholy, anger, jealousy, relief, and joy, each represented by a different palette of colors. I took my difficult relationship with crying and used it to create something beautiful. I am reminded that even through pain, there is still beauty. The first works I made for this collection are handkerchiefs that I used to absorb my real tears. The handkerchiefs act as a comfort when I'm crying, as well as preserve and amplify the power of my tears. Each handkerchief has a color from one of the five emotions and the delineations between each color are both jagged or smooth to show that all these emotions can feel both negative and positive. This image shows four out of the five large textile pieces installed in my gallery space. Each textile is dedicated to one of the five emotions, again, all based on color. I wanted to show multiple ways of displaying the textiles as I thought just hanging them flat against the wall would take away from their beauty. Instead, I hung the textiles in ways that would make them more sculptural and at different heights in, or in order to keep the viewer engaged. Here are some photos of the textiles along with short descriptions. Melancholy is deep and dark like midnight. I am heavy with the weight of the world on my shoulders. Despair that feels like a black hole in the pit of my stomach. The good in life does not outweigh the bad, hopeless. Jealousy is red like blood and the heart that pumps it. I am jealous of those who can control their crying. I am jealous of those who are not weighed down as I am. 
jealous of those who had better childhoods than I did. Anger is raging like fire. I am angry that perfection is unattainable. I am angry that my parents and teachers let me down. I am angry that I cannot control my crying. There is either too much or not enough. Relief is fresh and cool like water. As an adult, I feel relief when I cry. It relieves the pressure behind my sinuses and calms my headaches, like a monsoon that relieves a desert of its drought. Joy is bright and airy like a springtime field. The relief and release that comes from crying brings me joy. It is so rare for me to cry now that when I do, the tears often turn into those of happiness. I rejoice in the monsoon that comes. I also encouraged visitors to interact with my work as I really value the textural quality of the textiles. The textiles have a different pattern on the backside and I wanted visitors to be able to lift the pieces and see the underside as well. The last component of my thesis collection is an oversized patchwork cloak with 140 individual patches. The cloak is a six foot radius at its widest point and it took me around 40 hours to complete. The cloak has colors from all five emotions and acts as a comfort to the wearer. It also makes the wearer feel regal and powerful. I think it is really special to be able to draw power and strength from crying. Here are photos of me and a guest trying on the cloak at the gallery. And here is me helping a guest try on the cloak. I currently work as an instructor at the Academy of Design in Belmont, where I teach children age six and up to draw, design, sew, and construct outfits from scratch. At the end of each session, each child comes out with a full outfit that they designed and sewed. Here's a photo of me working with a student at the Academy. I plan to continue working here for the foreseeable future until I can get a quote unquote big girl job. And my next step is graduate school at SFSU in secondary education with intentions of becoming a high school art teacher. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening and I super appreciate you all for being here today. Thank you, Summer, so very much. Greatly appreciate it, good job. Now I'll invite Ingrid to share some com comments with you. Um. Okay, so Maxine's going to actually be sharing the comments. Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Let me highlight Maxine. Okay, just to clarify. <laughs> Maxine. <laughs> no worries. Hi, um, Summer, thank you so much for sharing your work with all of us and for sharing some of the back background, what informs your practice. I have a lot of, I wrote a lot down because I have a lot of questions about a lot of things. So I'm going to try to just dive in and we can see how much we get to. Um, the first thing I was really interested about uh, in is your, um, your earlier work in terms of constructing clothing and kind of how that, you kind of mentioned a feedback loop, but I'm curious about how, how that feedback loop works in your mind um, in your work around self-portraiture. So it feels like there, there might be this interplay between you making these garments, wearing them, and then perhaps, you know, making self-portraits with these sort of alterations to your body through textiles or um, enhancements or... So yeah, I, I wanna hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, I do really like playing with the meta of it all. Like I've, in the past, I've constructed an outfit, then taken photos in the outfit, then made paintings based off of those photos. Um, but, you know, it brings up a good point that it might be interesting if I push that even further. Like, what if I took those paintings and made a textile pattern from a distorted image of that? Like, um, encouraging the loop to continue, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels like process is really important and it feels like there are many you know, one thing can inform the next, can inform the next in a really exciting way where we're not sure what will actually be exhibited in the end or shown or in what capacity, but it seems like this translation process is really important to your practice. 
and that's exciting. And I think something you can keep pushing and um, exploring and it'll continue to be generative. So I'm excited about these self portraits that you're making and how it might be informed by these clothing or cloths that you're um, making. So that's one question I had. Um, another thing I really wanted to hear more about is, um, I noticed for the textiles titled Melancholy and Jealousy, and um, there was always writing that you were sharing alongside that. And I'm curious to hear more about your writing practice and also how you envision, so I really wanna hear a lot about that, but then also how you envision writing existing alongside your work if it were to be exhibited you know in this case it was in a digital presentation but do you see the writing existing alongside the work in an exhibition space for example yeah so i do consider myself to be a poet i love writing poetry um and creative writing and for a long time i've and even still now i kind of separate my written work from my visual work i think that's just how i was taught like in high school art classes they kind of discouraged um text from being within a visual image but um with james's class we went to a gallery and the whole gallery was dedicated to um incorporating text in visual art and it was really inspiring because i could see like different ways you can play with fonts and whether it's handwritten or if it's typed and you can use um the visual, the visualness of the word itself as an art piece. And I'm actually taking a poetry in translation class this semester. And for my final project, I am translating an untranslatable word and then using the letters of the word to create a portrait. So I think that will be a fun start to learning how to combine my written word with my visual art that's really i'm glad i'm really glad to hear that you're doing that and i who are you taking the class with denise newman she's amazing <laughs> you have a real treat working with denise so that's great i'm excited to hear you're taking a class with her um yeah i think knowing that writing can either exist to inform a work kind of again talking about this process of translation between both as you're doing one language to another and then seeing that that also applies to one medium to another and then also seeing and you giving yourself permission to have writing exist in some capacity as the work itself or as part of the work that you're exhibiting I think is really exciting and I think another interesting place one can play with using writing creatively is actually in the wall label so in how you list for example materials um, and that brings me to one other question I had or a comment I had for you, which is um, for the piece. Let me look if I find what I wrote. Um, I can't remember which piece, but where, where you had basically there were tears on the handkerchief. Mm. The handkerchief pieces, I guess. Is yeah. what they um, and I'm curious if you how if a viewer if you give that away to a viewer in an exhibition space, or if that's something that you hold as like a secret of the piece or how you navigate that in terms of listing materials. Yeah, I'm, I'm noticing that I'm kind of unsure, um, like you said, how much I reveal and how I want to reveal it. In the actual space, I didn't put any wall text saying that they had tears in them, um, partly just because I didn't know how to I couldn't come up with a, a nice enough way to put it, but I thought it was important to include in this presentation because it's like the, like you said, the background, the inspiration. Um, and it also kind of comes back to like, is art for yourself, is art for others, both. Mm -hmm. um, Someone who is really interesting with um, their titles is Josh Fott, who also teaches at CCA. Um, if you look at, his material listings, there is a lot of very poetic language in there and it's all very intentional. And, and also not, you know, it's just enough information. So everything has meaning that he lists and it's very, in, yeah, I recommend looking at it for inspiration. And I'm sure Denise would also have some thoughts on this actually. Um, 
but yeah, I think there are ways to give hints or to, you know, I think that's actually an important part of the work that you shared with us here. And so I feel like finding ways to bring in these sort of processes into descriptions of the work in, in very simple and intentional ways, I think can be really effective and can add a lot of meaning to the work um, that can work in your favor. So I definitely recommend kind of thinking about that. And it sounds like you're already doing it. And it's more just a question of navigating all these questions of how much to give away, how much not to give away. I was also curious about the scale of the handkerchiefs. I couldn't tell from the images exactly how big they are. They are 20 inches by 20 inches. So it sounds like you're also playing a little bit with scale and because that's larger than your average handkerchief, right? Like, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. I feel like it's slightly smaller. I mean, I know I don't, but I mean, that's not, I don't think that, I think there's something of playing with scale and how our body then relates to the object. Where if the handkerchief is slightly outsized, perhaps we feel a little bit smaller or there's some sort of strangeness that comes into the into play that I think is also very exciting. And I think um, alongside how you list the materials can be interesting. So I think that's working in your favor. That's not, I was just curious about how you're thinking about that. Yeah. I'm gonna jump in here right about now. And uh, thank you so much for what, um, what really great advice. And I'm gonna second what Maxine said, figuring out a way to um, use that as a part of the material, I think is really, it's very impactful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much, Summer, and thank you, Maxine. Thank you so much, Maxine. Thank you. I'll, I have a few artists to recommend to you, so I'll I'll find a way to reach out to you after. Perfect. I'll type my email in the chat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter is Rolando Rosales. Rolando, please share your screen. Okay, can you guys hear me? Okay, so, hi, I'm Rolando Rosales Aragon and I'm a painting and drawing major. And just to share a little bit um, about me, um, I was born and raised in Mexico and moved at the age of 14 to Renwood, California, where I currently live and create my work. Uh, some of the inspirations I have, like my two main inspirations are like Amy Cheryl and Frida Kahlo, the color and also the portraiture. Um, I got really interested in portraiture lately because my early work used to be like more like abstract, but also another influences that I have are like immigration, uh, being close to other people, hearing stories, music. Uh, getting color from walking in nature, you know, like looking at other stuff outside. Sometimes I choose color by my walks that I do uh, in the city or in the country where I live. Uh, he saw, there is some, some early work, um, nature ver versus music. I want to talk about this because it kind of like represents me as who I am and like why I study art. Um, so before I decided to get a degree in painting and drawing, I was a music major. And one day I decided to take a watercolor class, Falling Love and Change, to a painting and drawing major. Um, that led me into the figure of uh, painting. And during that time, it was uh, the, the running for Trump as a president. And as a Mexican, I was part of one of those groups one of those members as part of that group that you know that was very like going through a lot of problems you know because like people were telling you things the most horrible things um i don't think we need to go over that because we already know um so then when i became a student at cca it, the pandemic happened so my work totally changed and i was interested on creating portraits of people wearing a mask because that was like the moment that we were living. And it was also as a way to kind of like represent that closeness, that, that closeness I didn't have with other members because of the pandemic, because we were, you know, like each one locked down in their houses or whatever places you were. So a way for me to be closer to those people, you know, was like creating a portrait of, of them. 
Um, and after that, I just keep creating, you know, like more portraits of people and, you know, like painting family members, friends. Um, you know, I, I didn't, at that moment, I didn't want to like a special background. I just like was more interested on the figure and like the eyes and the looking, like the different textiles that people were wearing. And I just keep like painting portraits and portraits. Um, this is another one. Um, I started, you know, like experimenting instead of just having one figure, I added one more figure and painting and also like paying more attention to like the different colors that we see in the eyes. Cause I feel like eyes are like a bridge that connect two persons. Cause you know, we can see so many things in other people's eyes. And this is another portrait also with a mask, but I was like trying, you know, like instead of having a plain mask, I was like, what if I incorporate, you know, like something related to the identity of that person? So I started, you know, meeting people and I had this friend and he's like, although he, you know, he's like, his eyes are like very deep blue and he's kind of like light skin. He's uh, half Mexican, half, uh, uh, half Portuguese, but he's really proud of being Mexican. And, you know, like I saw one of one day he was walking in and wearing, you know, this mask with a Mexican flag. And I was like, hey, can I take a picture of you and use it as a portrait? Because, you know, like I was like, this is like kind of like the beginning of that thing that I want to do in the future. Then I also, I was interested also like keep painting portraits without a mask. And I was only able to do one. But, you know, it also was like a picture. Most of my work comes from like pictures. It was like interested to me this to do this portrait because it was like the last picture that my sister took before, like we all went to lockdown. So it was, you know, without a mask and everything. And after that, you know, like the whole pandemic. So, you know, like, I guess it was more normal to see people wearing a mask than being without a mask. Then um, while I was, um, I went back to CCA in person, I took a textile class and you know, started incorporating my work into a more abstract way. So, you know, the pandemic was still happening. So I was like, I just wanted to create something, you know, that in my own perspective kind of represents the pandemic, you know, the craziness that was going on and all the problems and difficulties we all face with the pandemic and the many situations that the pandemic led. So I started working, you know, with uh, fabrics, cotton, silk, dyes, like different textiles. This is another piece of textile with acrylic and, you know, working with different techniques, just um, trying, you know, to be, it was kind of like a break to be away from the portraiture. But thanks to this, this led me to my thesis work. You know, I was like, well, I mean, I have learned these different styles and techniques. So I think now is the time to work on a bigger scale and incorporate, you know, like the other techniques that I have learned in other departments. So this is my artist statement for my thesis work. And let me read it. My paintings are the representation of the experiences I have faced in the United States as an immigrant from Mexico. Through the use of portraiture, I depict the Latino community with the use of color and shapes as part of the anatomy of being in a foreign land. I celebrate friends and family in my paintings to indicate the pride and joy of being an immigrant. In portraiture, the eyes are an important element that can illustrate the feelings and emotions of humans. The illumination within the eyes represents the beauty of Latino community among different scenarios such as labor, migration, education, and daily life. Ultimately, my paintings bring awareness to the memories we keep alive in our minds and how they define our present and future. So this is my work, um, my thesis work. And as I said before, you know, I wanted to like keep painting portraits also with a mask because somehow we still live in, in a world, you know, like where we have to wear masks in certain scenarios. And also like um, pay more attention to the eyes. Like we often see a person like, oh, black eyes. And, you know, like we never look like there's more color, not just black. So, you know, I took pictures and then like I started creating watercolors but in a bigger scale because I was like, it's time to move on from like 1824, 24 by 30. So um, I created this um, portraits, which are 45 by 70. 
and this one is a watercolor and this is a self-portrait and i wanted to also talk about you know like the diaspora that we all face as an immigrant and you know like for example for me you know as a mexican when i came here and you know i got my papers i was assigned an alien number and you know like i never thought until like when i started working for this project that why an alien number you know like i'm just another human you know like so kind of like, like a way of making fun, but at the same time to, you know, make people think, you know, like we're all humans, you know, like why should I be called, you know, or have a reference number, you know, under the title of alien number. So that's why I created, you know, the background as a space to kind of like show, you know, how I feel every time I see the alien number on my documentation as an immigrant in this country. The next one. It's a Mexican workers on stolen land and it's an oil painting. And over here also, you know, the interesting about this story is like, I live on the country area, so I see a lot of home workers. And when I saw these workers, you know, working in the fields, I asked them if I could take pictures and also hear their story about, you know, like how they came here, why they're here. And it happened to be that the main character here in the, in the painting um, her family used to be, used to own land in California before the Mexican-American War. And they stayed here, but because of the things that happened, you know, they got rid of the, they totally, you know, like their land got stolen. So they went back to Mexico. So then she had to came here, you know, like many years ago, like, I don't know, probably this is like the fifth generation and being here and labeled as a title as an immigrant you know, when in reality, she cannot, she shouldn't be called an immigrant because she was, you know, here before all the chaos that happened between the two countries. Uh, this is a 36 by 36 and it's an oil painting. The next one is um, Claire. It, the title is Claire from Argentina and it's uh, my friend Claire. And I wanted to show you, you know, like also the story of her of being an Argentinian study here, which is another story, you know, she's also migrating, but in a different context, in a context of like seeking education in a foreign country and meeting new people. And like anytime that she meets, you know, a Latino, she's like proud to meet someone who speaks the language and, you know, like, like it's like that closeness and warmness of, uh, the Latino community has every time we face like another person from our community. This is also a watercolor on paper, 45 by 71. And then uh, the third one, the fourth one is, uh, the title is Cubanissima and it's oil on dyed cotton. And with this one, you know, it's also talks about the migration, you know, the diaspora, you know, she, this individual, when she was telling me the story in like her favorite colors to use it in the portrait, she was telling me that she faced the, the war of Cuba, you know, so she had to leave the island and left uh, her whole family, her mom died in the island. So, you know, she, although like all those horrible things happened in her country and in, in the island, you know, um, she's still proud of being Cuban and, you know, she's proud of her culture and all the things that happened uh, around her. And this is 44 by 78. And then the final piece for my thesis work, it's called Citizen of the World. And it's acrylic on cotton and it's 36 by 48. And also, you know, talking about the migration, um, when this is my cousin. So, you know, like talking about the story, like he's a citizen of the world. He doesn't have a place, you know, he doesn't have a settled place to say this is home. Like he's just like home for him is everywhere. So, you know, I was like, I wanted to kind of represent and, you know, like base the colors and like the type of clothes that he wears very vibrant. So, you know, that's why I decided to use like the orange color in the background to show, you know, his happiness, warmness, you know, and also his wildness and, you know, like not caring about like what you usually like or guidelines you need to follow, you know, after like graduating from school. Um, and and that's it. Um, my plans for post-graduation are prepare a show in Mexico and apply to grad school. And um, here are some my social media and my Instagram. Thank you, Rolando, um, so much. What a great presentation. So now I'll invite Maxine. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rolando. Those are really striking paintings and very skillful 
obviously. Um, I appreciate you sharing all of, all of this with us. Um, again, I have quite a few questions. I was taking notes frantically, so I'm gonna try to decipher them. Um, but one, um, a, few, a few things stood out to me, and I, I guess I'll just begin with this idea of the mask that you have uh, for your portraits that, uh, you know, it one points to a very particular time in history, which is now with the pandemic. But also as you were speaking about uh, the eyes becoming so important, um, there was, it suddenly struck me this idea that the, the mask is also covering the mouth, which is the site for speech, for sound, for eating, uh, for so many things. Um, and so suddenly the eyes felt like they were um, trying to communicate things that, you know, as the mouth was covered. And um, specifically, let me try to find the title of the piece. There were a few, um, I guess, mostly just as you were telling these stories that maybe a viewer of a painting wouldn't know. But as I was getting all this background information, these stories that people had gone through, that contrast became even more stark, right? Like you're telling the story as this person is unable to, you know, or at least muffled somehow through this mask. So I'm curious if that was something that you were thinking about in addition to sort of the reality of the pandemic. And I have more questions about, I guess I'll say one more thing before, um, which is that I also really was interested in the way then the mask became um, a surface for you to kind of imbue with identifying iconography sometimes like the sun or uh, I can't remember, but the mask also became like a surface onto which maybe some of what couldn't be said was then sort of projected, if that makes sense. So I'm just curious about this exploration that you had between the eyes and the mask and that covering the mouth and if you were thinking about some of these things as well. Yeah, I actually was thinking, you know, when I was preparing actually the first portraits and I was like, well, I mean, you know, I can paint the mask, but at the same time, you know, like the mask is covering, you know, like an important element of our speech, which is the mouth. But at the same time, I was like, you know, it's like for me at the, the beginning portraits were, were like, these are portraits that are showing different masks and at the same time, like kind of like the different levels or acquisitions that people have because some masks probably were more expensive than the others. Some had like this brand, some had this other more techniques, some were more colorful. And you know, like some will show like, I guess the identity of that person and others were more like more simple, but it was something very like, powerful to me because I also when I started this like I was hit by COVID so you know like to me it was like a way like okay here we go like we all can say as many as we want but now because well the things that we're facing this is like our you know like the thing that's gonna cover us to you know like to be alive to be present in this time yeah yeah that makes sense that duality, that strange duality too, of like on the one hand, this is what we need to do to survive kind of thing. And then on the other hand, how it also speaks to sort of an absence, at least in the images of a mouth, right? And then how the eye, it was just very strange to me how the eyes became so much more of a focal point, which I've noticed in interactions too with people where you're reading, you know, a different part of the face. So more intently. Um, I was also, I wanted to comment you know, I noticed that many of the paintings, as you also noted, don't didn't have backgrounds um, or, or didn't have, you know, a, a scene in the background. But I was struck by um, Alien Number, that piece, um, the background of space. And, um, and I noticed that you mentioned this was kind of a referencing the alien, you know, number and um, kind of poking fun of it at it, even as you're also addressing sort of the gravity of this categorization. Um, but also the background really felt expansive and made me think about sort of the arbitrariness of borders and, you know, these kind of nationalistic lines that, you know, we draw. And so I thought, I don't know if that's something that you were thinking about, but it definitely sort of had both of those meanings uh, were present for me. So I don't know if you were thinking about that at all as well or. 
yeah, you're totally right. <laughs> that was what I was trying Beautiful. to go for. Yeah. Um, on a very just technical level, I'm curious about what the role, uh, uh, like how you think about painting in watercolor and oil in your practice, why you do both, um, how, how they're different for you in terms of processes, if you distinguish it all in terms of what you draw in the medium, those kind of things. So watercolor, I have to say that I'm really like impacted by watercolor because somehow I have this like relation to music, like the way the pigments flow on the paper and everything kind of like reminds me, like takes me back to that like moment when I was a music student. So that's why, you know, like most of the time, like I do like some paintings in oil and then all of a sudden I change the watercolor and then from watercolor, I could go from acrylic and then I will do something different. Like there's not a specific medium that I will say I will do most of the time this because I guess it all depends on how I'm like thinking about like how to approach this project and you know like doing the dye fabric for like one of the paintings for like the Cubanissima I dyed the fabric and I was like okay like what should I do here you know should I put a medium for watercolor or oil but then I was like no it's oil but then as I moved to the next painting I'm like no I want watercolor and like I guess it's not in a specific way for me to choose the painting, it's just whatever I want in the moment and whatever I feel, you know, is like gonna work better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And I was excited, I was gonna point out that I was excited to see sort of your textile experimentation that you were doing for a while find its way into one of your portraits as the, as the background. And are you thinking of doing more of that in the, into the future? Yeah, I think I'm going to still, you know, working on that in the future and maybe, you know, try some new things. Mm -hmm. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, anything can happen. I'm going to jump in. I'm going to jump in really quick. And I agree with that, uh, Maxine. That was, I loved that with the second to last painting, the woman, so vivid and beautiful. Really great. Thank you, Rolando. Thank you. Again, Rolando, I have some artists that I thought of that I had dinner time for. So if you want to put your email address in the chat too. Okay, I will. Thank you. Thank you both. All right, our next presenter is um, Mia Jirasi. Hi. Yeah. All right. Hi, my name is Mia Rossi, and I am a painting major and writing minor. Um, the little guys are covering my statement. <laughs> uh, in a world of seemingly endless and unstoppable chaos, in a post-privacy generation where everything about you is extracted and exploited for profit, it's becoming increasingly difficult to genuinely know oneself and find a purpose in life outside of social media and monetization. Being born into this age of impending apocalypse, feeling helpless to stop it, and still being expected to live life like everything is normal is more than just confusing, it's traumatic. Growing up mentally ill and feeling like the late stage capitalist world around me was not built for me, left me with so many unanswered questions. Questions that mainstream society didn't have the answers for. So I went searching for them elsewhere and I began to find them in art and music, namely the counterculture scenes like punk and goth where being weird didn't feel so lonely. This series is my journey of self-exploration to find meaning in the melody. Yeah. Uh, so my family has always engaged in art in many forms from visual to music to the written word. Uh, they were very supportive always growing up. Uh, both my parents are musicians uh, and, I've, and they've been playing in bands for like their whole lives. I've followed in their footsteps by playing bass in a punk band of my own and going to fine arts, uh, going uh, for a fine arts degree, just like my mom. Uh, so yeah, my music practice and my painting practice are very closely linked and feed off of each other. Uh, many, many of my paintings begin as poems that I've written or songs that I love. So a lot of my stuff is influenced by punk album art. Uh, two traditional artists that I really like are Carlos Almaraz and Ludwig Meitner. Uh, I feel like they both 
use like painterly stuff and line art and like uh, talk about these really dark topics um, and make really chaotic work, which I love. Uh, so like I mentioned in my uh, artist statement, I grew up mentally ill and grappling with a lot of questions of identity and purpose. Um, this painting is about feeling empty and trapped inside yourself, uh, a feeling I find myself coming back to a lot. But I finally started to recognize myself in the alternative rock music scenes, such as punk goth and emo, uh, where these countercultures encourage individuality, reject societal pressures, and embrace the taboo, which helped me to unlearn some societal conditioning and able, be able to begin unraveling myself. Uh, so embracing the taboo to me is about opening up room to explore things. Uh, it takes the power away from the dominant culture by doing a full 180 and uh, branding itself as the very thing that you're told to not engage with. Uh, so like in punk, they talk about anarchy to make you question authority figures. In emo, they talk about death and suicide to make people feel less alone and like they can talk about what they're going through. And in goth, they talk a lot about devil worship and witchcraft to kind of poke fun at that and to delegitimize fear, fear mongering from like uh, religious institutions. And these themes uh, are things I wanted to highlight in my work over the last couple of years. So music has always been a therapeutic tool for me. And once I began to venture out to shows, I really felt a sense of excitement and belonging. I felt like this is me. This is what it feels like to be on the right path. And I felt very similarly when I started um, going to protests and engaging in a lot of activism. I felt like I was on the right path and doing what I was supposed to be doing and in a community that felt the same way that I did. So I tried to capture the fact that it's like a similar feeling of anxiety and anxiousness and collective consciousness um, through this diptych. Uh, so I like to use a variety of styles and borrow both from like paint, the painterly fine arts and the very in your face graphic style of punk uh, album art. Uh, and I like to use varying levels of rendering uh, and different mixed media elements to kind of add to the chaos I'm trying to create. Uh, so this was one of the first pieces um, in my Back Alley Doctor series. It was like a mind map uh, to help me create a, uh, a fake band, a fake art band. Uh, and then I started creating CD cases and merch for my fake band. And then I decided to come back to this stream of consciousness and turn it into more of a mind map by making it into a, like a police crime board. Uh, so varying levels of rendering, as I mentioned, and I've noticed keeping backgrounds really uh, sparse are things I really like to use to focus the viewer's attention on the most important object and force a kind of tunnel vision. Uh, the tunnel vision can be from a haze of excitement or the void of isolation, but sometimes when you're feeling an extreme emotion, kind of like everything else goes into a blur, and that's what I like to make in a lot of my art. Uh, I found starting from dark backgrounds to be really helpful uh, for thematic relevance. Uh, I did a lot of self-portraiture uh, during the beginning of my uh, self-discovery, if you will. Uh, and I uh, ma made a lot of work about my mental illness, a subject that emo music delves into very intensely. Uh, it was really interesting to see how I saw myself, depending on how I was feeling. Uh, so on the left is like a representation of feeling very welcome uh, and having like a sense of self. And then on the right is a piece about like isolation, feeling lonely and not having a shaky identity and not really knowing what you are. 
Uh, so my musical philosophy tells me I have a duty to myself to find out who I am, but also I have a duty to others to stand up and do my part to fix things that I see wrong in the world. Uh, so punk music has a lot about uh, critiquing the establishment and speaking out on important issues. So I wanted to make some work uh, in that vein. These are both critiques of um, corporations and capitalism. The right is uh, about uh, Disney's monopoly on media and the left is about um, how a lot of big corporations uh, profited a lot off of the COVID pandemic while regular people were dying. Uh, so I kind of did a 180 this year. Uh, at the beginning of last semester, I had a lot of just bad experiences back to back that made me not really want to make art anymore. So I receded to something more comfortable to me, which is landscapes, uh, something I hadn't done for a while because I felt like they were kind of conceptually plain and something that I had done a lot of. Uh, but so when I came back to it, I poured a lot of emotion into it and I tried to make them a little bit weird to add to the, uh, to like be more on theme. And I think I managed uh, to create something that actually really helped my concept and added to the bizarre and helped me get in touch uh, with another element of healing, which is nature. Uh, so continuing on with that, uh, I decided to make uh, these rituals because uh, I was kind of getting tired of making paintings the traditional way. So each of these boards is broken into cardinal directions and then you place items on the board depending on the element that coincides with those uh, directions. And then the idea is to put it under the full moon and uh, charge it with positive energy and like set your intentions into the objects. Uh, so once I was done, I took the objects off and I uh, photo transferred uh, pictures of them back onto the board. I'm really happy with this and this is uh, kind of tapping into the Gothic and it was the inspiration for one of my two, Oops, sorry. Uh, so this is one installation I created based off of the moon circle ritual. Uh, so I made a second ritual board. Uh, so I was trying to make the theme of this one, self-reflection, healing, reconnecting with nature. Um, it's representing the goth philosophy. So it's meant to be calming and an opportunity to center yourself and find a moment of peace to manifest good energy and reconnect with who you are. Because goth and to an extent emo hide their love of life under all these dark themes. Because it's not really about the darkness, it's about embracing the darkness and finding peace within dark times. Uh, You're at 10 minutes. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Just letting you know. Sorry, this is my uh, second installation. Um, where goth is very like peaceful punk wants nothing to do with peace it's very angry and in your face so i made this one very uh explosive and chaotic uh with a lot of things to look at and pay attention to uh, <laughs> uh and then through in both of my uh installations there's a bunch of like plain objects and then hidden within those objects is like more works that I made, smaller works. I wanted to uh, reward the viewer for spending time with the pieces because for me, this was like a search for myself. So I want to make them search and do a little bit of the work uh, themselves because I've always felt that uh, the best work is uh, means just as much to the viewer as it does uh, to the creator, even if the meanings they find are totally different. So I was hoping since this was deeply personal to me, but I'd like to think that my work is also speaking to other people and maybe helping them uh, go on a similar journey of finding themselves and unlocking uh, who they really want to be. Thank you. Thank you, Mia.
And I will again invite Maxine. Thanks, Mia, for sharing your practice and giving some background information <clears throat> on your work. It's really, um, I like, I mean, I'm impressed by the breadth of it and how it sort of developed throughout your time at CCA. And I'm really interested in, I again wrote down a lot of things, but one question is just this, to talk a little bit more about the relationship you have to music and if you see music existing alongside these pieces in any way at, when they're installed. Like, do you, cause I saw like a, I think an electric guitar in one of the installations, right? Like, is there music playing sometimes or is it more just invoking the music but the installation actually being silent? Yeah, I actually did have a, a speaker. Uh, I made a playlist specifically for my event. Uh, and I actually have written uh, a lot of songs uh, that I think go with a lot of my work. I haven't produced those songs yet, but I definitely see my um, practices feeding off of each other in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be exciting to see how that can develop over time if there are, again, ways to kind of weave the two together. Um, but also interesting to have a practice so informed by music where music is then absent in the actual, you know, sound is actual absent in the, in the work that you show. So either one kind of carries a lot of meaning, I think. So worth kind of thinking about more. Um, I wanted to mention an artist named Libby Black, who we're actually showing at Slash right now, but part of her practice is making uh, or, or replicating objects with cardboard, paint, paper, glue, uh, which reminded me of sort of the, one of your last slides with the Easter eggs, as you called them. Um, mm -hmm. But just making me think about how, um, first I have a question for you. Do you, are they entire, what are they made of? These things that you're kind of inserting into the installations that are handmade versus the found objects? Yeah, well, I have um, a couple of CD cases that I painted on. Uh, I have some clay objects, just a couple small objects that I put really tiny paintings on as well. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to do like different scales. I have one like giant banner with a projection on it and then I have these little teeny guys. Nice, yeah, yeah. I recommend going to see the show if you can. I, I was interested in what you said about these objects being among um, found objects uh, that you didn't make. And that, that made me think about how uh, these objects require attention on your hand to make and sort of make seem like the object that they're you know, replicating, um, but also that it require, requires a lot of um, care and attention on the viewers and to spend enough time with the work to, to find those. And um, I guess I'm curious about, is it your intention for that, for them to spend that time, I guess, to, to find the differences? Is it important to you or does that, is that just something that unfolds for, the, for certain people? Yeah, I like to think of it as like, I think people who connect to the work will spend more time with it and then they're rewarded for sticking around and they can find more things to be interested in like the longer they spend with it. Because mm -hmm. I like, to, I, I doubt that everyone who comes will pay that much attention, but for the people who it, it speaks to, I think they will. Like one of those, another little like secret of the work that only certain people might discover. Um, your work, I believe it was titled Breaking Free. Um, I was, I just wanted to clarify or ask you about um, when you said putting the work under the full moon. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, is that something you did in the process of making the work or something that you want the viewers to do or I don't know. Yeah. Um, so Moon Circle is uh, the name of the ritual. I actually performed uh, two rituals. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff on the board you can see from it. Uh, so yeah, I put it under the full moon and I spent time with the board uh, and then made the objects on top of it, yeah. Mm. So again, similarly to Summer's work, there is that question of, do you want viewers to know that? How do you give that away when you display the work or is that unimportant? And is that again, kind of just something you hold knowing about the piece, but interesting to think about, I think. 
And um, this is maybe a little, just came to mind, so I might as well just say it, but um, Yoko Ono's Grapefruit, that you know how, I don't know if you've read it before, but it's basically just poems with, or little writing prompts that maybe don't ever even have to be fulfilled, but they are so evocative in terms of sort of the visuals that they conjure. So it might be something related to sort of these rituals that you do in relation to your pieces that maybe there can be, I don't know, maybe this is a side of the work that you also continue developing more, which is more sort of what, what you do alongside the work and keeping a record of it somehow or something like that. Um, I also wanted to recommend uh, Toyin o o Ohi Odotola, I believe is how you pronounce her name. Um, she is a CC alum, I believe, but her most recent, um, or one of her most recent body of work also begins with a dark, a black ground and builds up through lighter tones. So that might be another artist to look into in terms of if you wanna work on that series a little bit more, um, yeah. Um, let me think. What we're else. just about at time. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. I'll, I, I have a few more things, but again, I can email you if you want. And yeah. Thank you both again. Thank you. Mia. Congrats. <laughs> and our last presenter is Kayla Suvelo. All right. Let me just share my screen. Can you all see that? Yes. All right. So hi, my name is Kayla Swabillo. I was born in San Francisco, but grew up in Elk Grove, which is a suburb of Sacramento. Um, and I'd also like to mention that I transferred from SFAI during the onset of the pandemic. Oops. All right. Um, so I'll begin by reading my artist statement. Really, really briefly, I hate to interrupt. We're getting a small screen of your screen. Maybe you just need to screen share. Oh, you, can you see my notes? Yeah, it's a really small thing. So just hit okay. there. Is that better? That is your presentation. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know you could see that. So yeah, I'll begin by reading my artist statement. Uh, my work acts as a grounding technique for myself, as well as an inlet for others into the world of mental health. Um, as someone who dissociates due to anxiety and depression, I often feel as if I'm not in my own body. Replicating various parts of the body through paintings and sculptures allows me to regain a sense of self. Um, I remind myself I'm human. I've always been fascinated by the human body and how its functions relate to one's mental state. With repetitive with repetitive imagery of skin and eyes, the, de the body's defensive barrier into the and the windows to the soul, I get to the heart of our own defenses and what makes us human. Blurring the line between subject and object challenges the viewer to look inward and question themselves. In doing so, I allow them to see through the lens I've created to explore my own psychological state. Um, from an early age, it was clear that I was stricken with morbid curiosity um, at my elementary school library, I checked out books about the human body and the history of medicine. And at the root of it all was my desire for science and learning about the darker aspects of the past. Another thing that captivated me was Ripley's Believe It or Not. And as cheesy as it seems to be, I fell in love with the weirdness of it all. Um, as of recently, I have found this strange, this same sense of curiosity in the Mütter Museum of the College of Physicians of Phil of Philadelphia, which is a medical museum filled with wax models, skeletons, and various anatomical specimens, among other things. And along with these darker interests, I have a strong connection to my childhood, specifically stuffed animals. And as a result of my interests, it only makes sense that I love oddities, taxidermy, and anything of the sort. Um, my love of natural history, dark subjects, and the weird seem to intermingle into one. And beginning in 2011, a web series called Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared was posted to YouTube. Each episode of the series begins with a Sesame Street-esque children's show with puppets that sing about the lesson they are teaching. Um, however, about halfway through each episode, there's always a dreary twist that traumatizes the main characters. Um, and this particular screenshot uh, is from the fifth episode, which covers the importance of eating healthy, although the song quickly turns to be about cannibalism. And the last influence I've included is the artist Aaron Weisenfeld. 
Much of his art depicts landscapes with lanky feminine figures. Uh, ominous and bleakness drape many of the scenes. And beginning with my painting looking inward, I wanted to create a piece that both shocked and intrigued the viewer. At the time, I was really interested in Caravaggio's chiaroscuro and how the subjects were often surrounded by complete darkness. And in a way, I also felt surrounded by complete darkness. Um, this next work, which I lovingly call my skin cube, despite it not being an actual cube, takes a closer look at the body's largest organ. I explore the colors within the skin and the minute details of acne scars, open skin, pores, and fine hairs. Um, I painted the sides of this rather thick canvas to make it appear as if it was wrapped in skin itself. And in doing so, I transformed the small square into its own being. In this piece, I was thinking about society's beauty standards regarding body hair and the stigma surrounding it. Um, but I was also uh, thinking about how since everyone was stuck at home, all of a sudden it was okay to grow out your body hair. And I felt like I was also in a sort of limbo in between childhood and adulthood because uh, due, to, due to the pandemic, I was now an adult returning to the house I spent most of my life in. Um, and while I was at SFAI, I took my first ceramics, ceramics class. And in this piece, I continued my imagery of the rolled back eye, but I added a three-dimensional element. I wanted this piece to appear as if it was freshly cut off of one's face. Um, and fast forward two years, I returned to the eye, except I focus on the eye bag. I wanted to emphasize the fatigue and dread brought on not only by Zoom fatigue, but by the heaviness of life itself. In this piece, I reimagined my skin cube, but in this new medium I was exploring called paper clay. I love the feeling of sculpting and painting this piece, and it brought me more joy than painting on the canvas. Um, and here I take a more literal approach to the term skin cube. I wanted to play around with reality and fiction. Um, and at this time, I was also exploring with painting on fabric. I admire the, the softness and tenderness of textiles and fabrics, so it seemed fitting to meld these softer pieces into my body of work. I adored how this fabric seems to absorb the paint because it felt like the paint and the fabric were becoming one, as opposed to me painting on top of the fabric. Um, and also sustainability and reusing is important to me, so I used old clothes and fabric scraps that I had to incorporate this dark yet childlike text to the piece. And now I'm going to discuss my senior thesis show, Hold It In, which is currently on its final day on view at 151 Hubble Street. Um, and in this show, I really wanted to focus on oddities and how they were displayed. Um, when I was younger, I fell in love with the show called Oddities, which aired on the Discovery Channel. And it showcased a store called Obscura Antiques and Oddities in LA, um, which led me to fall in love with um, oddity shops and displays in general. And in the show, I also wanted to add a more personal element, um, especially one which most people may not know about. So in one of the jars, I have included a skin slab of hemangioma. Um, this is a small cluster of extra blood vessels under the skin that can be present at birth or appear during the first week or two of life. Um, they're usually harmless and fade over time, and I actually have three of them. I have one on my cheek, I have one on my left arm, and one on the right side of my torso. Um, on the subject of personal aspects, I'm a really emotional person, so I wanted to showcase that as well. And among the shelves are several jars labeled with different kinds of tears, including depression, joy, and anxiety. And however, among the bleak and depressing items, there are also some inspired by a sort of dark humor and playfulness, which brings back those childlike qualities into the work. And on the other wall of the show are some paintings, including my skin cube, my piece looking inward, and some blood splatters. And there's also a smaller cabinet filled with small organ pieces and what I call nonsense teeth. Um, again, toying with ideas of reality and fiction. 
And last but not least, there are these legs. Um, when I created these, I was thinking about my past work featuring legs. Um, but in addition, I was yet again thinking about the concept of being in limbo between childhood and adulthood and puberties, as well as society's role into all of it. And these topics I feel will forever influence my work, especially as I step more into the realm of experimenting with sculpture and different materials. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kayla. Very good presentation. And Maxine will join us. Thanks so much, Kayla. This was such a nice, <clears throat> helpful overview again of your practice and how it's sort of evolved and how you've moved between mediums kind of from painting into other sort of more three-dimensional mediums like clay and paper clay, which I didn't even know was a thing. And, um, and then how you kind of have displayed the work for your thesis exhibition as well. Um, I really appreciate your handling of sort of potentially grotesque um, bodily experiences in a humorous way also. Like it doesn't feel overly, hu like there, you strike a really great balance, I think, between drawing me in, making me interested at feeling um, genuine, but then also there being a healthy dose of kind of humor drizzled in there. So I think that you achieved that well. And I thought that that was particularly clear in the, um, in the way you install the thesis exhibition where you have uh, sort of those jars of tears uh, where I'm not sure, like, are these really <laughs> tears? Is this water? Like, that's a lot of tears, you know? <laughs> like, I'm just like, I'm left in a really unsure state, but it's really effective, I think. Could you, again, I couldn't, I didn't quite catch, there were the three paintings and then there were the writing, I believe on, on paper, kind of between the paintings for your thesis exhibition. Could you say again what that was? Cause I missed it as you were talking. Uh, I could show it again too, if you want. And then just, I just was curious. If that's yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, is it these red pieces? that you're talking about? Okay, so yeah, these are um, actually the base of these like uh, Bruce Connor-esque ink blots. Mm -hmm. So I, I made this piece based on like uh, periods and long story short, this is based on like how many uh, menstrual products I had used during like the time period from beginning my period to when I switched to using a menstrual cup. And I just wanted to really highlight like the amount of products and like waste we're creating with this like natural uh, bodily like function. Mm. Um, so I would, using gouache and watercolor, I created a bunch of random or seemingly random um, shapes. And I went into Photoshop, flipped them and turn them into Bruce Connor-esque ink blots. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you went and talked a little bit more about this piece. So it's also kind of a, a way of record keeping or, or yeah. some, and it grew over time? Um, I actually made this after doing all of the math. I had figured out that this is the piece I wanted to do. I like on average, I calculated like how much um, mental products I had used, but it, um, seeing these instead of the finished digital product, just seeing this like um, in a more tangible form was so interesting. And uh, all of these, it's not in the picture and I don't have a picture included, but each of these are num numbered also with like a tiny little like, oh, 872 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then do you, in any accompanying it anywhere, do you kind of explain the piece at all? Or, I mean, at, when you displayed it, basically? Uh, no, I don't. I only have the title of the show because I just wanted all of the pieces to exist as one group. Okay. And you hung them with Band-Aids or did I not? Yeah, I did. Okay, that's funny. Yeah, no, that's great. And your, <laughs> and your paintings are beautiful. I mean, they're incredibly skillful. And um, I'm curious about 
your process of isolating certain body parts almost not quite an abstract I mean the skin maybe without a title one wouldn't immediately recognize it but there's this kind of play between zooming in so much that things become abstract and so or almost abstract at least and so I guess I'm curious because they feel on the one hand also kind of like portraits so I just want to hear you talk a little bit about more about those pieces yeah, for a while, I considered my art as sort of, and I still do, as sort of self-portraiture, um, although it is a bit abstract and it's not a direct, like, painting of my face or anything. Um, I mean, yes, I use, like, my own facial features as the reference or, like, my own skin as the reference, but it's not, like, your typical uh, definition of a self-portrait. Um, but, yeah, I would still consider my work portraiture in a sense even the sculptural works mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting because you're almost inviting people so in like you're come come this close like look at my skin this close but in a way that also abstracts the work because you're holding them at bay because yeah. like it could be my skin but it could also be someone else's skin or something completely different you're just misreading this so it's this really interesting interplay between like extreme intimacy and boundaries or you know a kind of mystery that you're maintaining so I think you're doing that very effectively um a few artists that come to mind are Flavia Dorso actually who had some skin related pieces and also um so if, yeah that's my, I can again email this if it's easier than like trying to remember the names right now and also yeah. An artist named Vincent Miranda who similar to you works with sort of parts of bodies to um to point to maybe a larger a, a to point to a larger like a full body but also the gesture becoming quite heightened as it's sort of isolated from the rest of the body and I guess lastly I wanted to ask you um you have these isolated body parts that are often quite zoomed in and I'm curious if you feel like they're active or passive like are they you know engaged in a gesture or are they um I don't know if that makes sense as a question but um how you're thinking of them activated in the space as you make them yeah I, I sort of like feel that in a way they're sort of both I feel like they're really like charged and active but at the same time they're just objects and like if someone is just viewing it who like may not know like oh this is I don't know my art they just think oh this is just like some prop or some mannequin arm that's like laying here on the shelf mm -hmm. or this is just a jar of red water or something like that mm -hmm. but like just I feel like sitting and reflecting in it really helps to make them like to help like activate them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and the way you've kind of combined them in this space too I feel they begin to tell like they, be they they form a new whole that might just not be one body but that sort of begins to become this other being that you know you kind of begin piecing together these different components that you've created um yeah, so I, yeah, I'm very struck by your practice and I appreciate you sharing it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both again. So now we can go back to our regular screens. Um, I would like to again thank Maxine Shoya Wolf today for joining us as our respondent. Um, again, this is recorded. So if there's anything you want to go back and names or anything like that, you can watch it again. Um, but I'd like just to take a quick moment to do your mics off and do a you know scream of congratulations or the you know celebratory hands. Good job. Yay. Thank you, Yay, everybody. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you all so much for showing up to this event that I am hosting one more of these events next week at the same time, so I hope that you can all attend. Um, as of today, we are, we are concluding this uh, event, but I wanted to again thank everyone for attending and thank all of the artists for your wonderful presentations and um, everyone for showing up. I really appreciate it. Have a great weekend. So it's weird signing off on Zoom, but. <laughs>
Thank you, everybody, 